Silent Hill 2. I mean, it's a game that doesn't need much introduction, right? Easily one of, if not the most revered horror game ever made, and one of the few games that has the luxury of being regarded as more than just a video game. For years now, Silent Hill 2 has been considered art, and as far as I'm concerned, for a damn good reason. The game follows James Sunderland, a man still mourning over the death of his wife Mary, until one day he gets a letter from her, asking him to come to Silent Hill, to their, as she called it, special place. You know, I kind of feel since I've been playing horror games and watching horror films my entire life that at this point I'm a bit desensitized to the genre, but man, there's still something about Silent Hill 2 that gets under my skin to this day. It's a lot scarier than other horror games, even in 2022. But I don't mean scary just because of the spooky monsters. The game has an emotional undertone that makes it feel very real. While Silent Hill 1 is terrifying, grotesque, and nightmarish, 2 has a very different atmosphere. A more depressing, gloomy, sorrowful tone, and it handles it with so much grace. You know, enough geeking though. Instead of making a video essay, I just decided I'm going to make it simple. I am going to make a list of 100 things that I love about Silent Hill 2, because it is no surprise to anyone that I am a massive simp for this franchise. Kind of obvious, but this list will definitely contain spoilers. To be able to fully appreciate it, I really do recommend playing this game first, but hey, either way, uh, spoilers abound. Let's go. 100 things that I love about Silent Hill 2. Maria? You said you took everything. But you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? I love the music used in the intro for the game. Silent Hill was always good for its guitar tracks. It sets the tone well, but it just straight up slaps. Speaking of the intro, I love how there's cutscenes in it that aren't seen at any point in the game, like James carrying somebody here and Laura messing around with Eddie here. They make you wonder about who these characters are and how you'll come across them in the story. Silent Hill 1's intro was pretty great for this too. I love the very first cutscene in the bathroom. James looks so worn out, even though the story is only just beginning. I feel it introduces his character well and how mentally drained he is, desperately clinging on to hope that his wife is still alive. Beyond that though, I just love how disgusting and grimy this bathroom looks. There are games today that don't have this level of detail in their environments. For 2001, this is mind-blowing stuff. I love how there's actually a poster of Heaven's Night here, it's pretty easy to miss. Marie is on the poster as well, someone we encounter later on in the game. I love how Silent Hill fans lost their mind when someone revealed that if you turn up the brightness in this opening cutscene, James is looking directly at the player. Not sure if this is intentional or not, but considering the attention to detail in this game overall, I would not be surprised if this was on purpose. I love James's monologue in the car park at the beginning of the game. You can just really tell how distraught he is over Mary's death. Guy Sihi did a fantastic job voicing James. A dead person can't write a letter. Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. So then, why am I looking for her? I love the song that plays here too. Unfortunately, it's not on the official soundtrack, but you can find it under a few different names on YouTube. Letters, Wishful Thinking, Letters from Silent Heaven. Looking up any of these names will get you this song. I love how you can see a sign for Brahms near the car park. For anyone who doesn't know, this is the town Sybil Bennett comes from in Silent Hill 1. I love how when you're running through the forest you hear these sounds. Like, what the hell are they supposed to be? That's terrifying. I love how you can find a ripped up poster that looks very similar to the Here's Johnny scene from The Shining. Team Silent were massive Stephen King fans, so this is not surprising at all. I love the way Angela corrects herself here. I'm looking for my mama. I, I mean my mother. I love how when you're saving the game, the background is just James's vacant stare. In other games like Resident Evil, saving usually offers a brief moment of respite, but here even just saving is unsettling. I love how when you're in the apartments, James reaches through the bars to get a key and the tension builds and you're expecting something sinister, but... Mm. Ow! Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, wait! Damn it! I love how on the third floor of Woodside Apartments, you can hear breathing.
It's like the building is alive or something. It's really creepy. I love how the mannequin in room 205 of Woodside Apartments is wearing Mary's clothes. I love how after you get the handgun, you hear a scream. And when you run to find out where it came from, Pyramid Head is just waiting behind bars. Not moving, just watching you. I love how when you turn off the flashlight, Pyramid Head glows bright red. This is probably where his other nicknames come from. Red Pyramid Thing or Akai Sankakuto in Japanese. I love how when you go into room 202, there's just ambient noises in the background, but when you specifically walk into the butterfly room, the music becomes louder and more aggressive. But when you walk back out, the music calms down again. I love how when James reaches into this hole, something gives him a fright and he jumps back, but we don't get any indication of what it could be. Considering the fact the music in this game usually gets louder as you approach an enemy, it makes me wonder if it's an off-screen monster that neither us nor James are able to see. I just love when you're running down a hallway and you hear the radio static slowly kick in and get louder as you approach a monster. It just builds so much dread knowing there's an enemy nearby. It was a genius design choice on the devs part. I love your first encounter with Pyramid Head in this game. You might have come across a few monsters up until now, but he is not one you'll want to be messing with. Speaking of Pyramid Head, I love how the dev team animated his movement in this game. Despite having more of a humanoid shape than some of the other monsters, the way he moves is still so uncanny and unnerving. It almost looks like he's rubber banding when he moves. It's so natural, but really adds to how otherworldly he is. Small detail, but I love Pyramid Head's webbed hands in this game. It's a detail that goes amiss in his later designs, and I really wish they kept it. I love how James just shoots at Pyramid Head wildly and then has this cocky look in his face. Just because he's the protagonist doesn't mean he's very smart. I love and hate how visceral Eddie sounds when he's throwing up in the bathroom. <laughs> it really makes me wonder what poor soul had to record this audio for the devs. I love how Eddie has no clue what James is talking about when he asks him has he seen Pyramid Head. It's the first hint we get that Pyramid Head is unique to James's experience of Silent Hill. I love how if you enter room 209 of Blue Creek Apartments, there's a random chance you might hear whispering in the game. Fans are still speculating to this day what the whispers say. I love how you can find a magazine outside the apartments that talk about Walter Sullivan, a very prominent character in Silent Hill 4 The Room. It's so cool that they made Walter a fully-fledged character years later, or perhaps his role in the franchise was being planned as early as 2001. I love the song that plays when you encounter Angela called Promise Reprise. It's one of the most iconic songs in the franchise, and for good reason. It's actually one of the songs that pushed me to take up learning piano as a kid. I love how Angela is lying in front of a massive mirror taking up the entire wall. I always felt it's kind of symbolic of her being very critical of herself, constantly looking inward and lacking self-esteem. Especially considering she says this in the same scene. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. When you enter the stairway, you come across Pyramid Head doing... Uh, something to a mannequin. Pyramid Head is just characterized as such an oppressive, violent creature, and I have mad respect for Team Silent being so ballsy to do this in their video game. I love how in the fight that ensues with Pyramid Head, you don't even have to really fight him at all. Waiting it out makes him eventually leave. That being said, shooting him does speed up the process a lot. I love how when Pyramid Head swings his knife at you, you can hear him grunt. It sounds very much like a human, so it really kind of makes you wonder what the hell he is. I love how Pyramid Head manages to grab you during the fight, you can just about see he has some kind of tongue coming out of his head, what the fu- I love how Laura is clearly voiced by an actual child, which is kind of a rarity in voice acting these days. The actress Jackie Breckenridge was 8 years old at the time of recording, the same age as Laura. Watching the cutscene when you meet Maria, I realized how much I really love the facial animations in this game. For an early PS2 title, the attention to detail in their faces is fantastic. I love how Maria reacts when James tells her Mary is waiting in their special place. And that's here? Side note, I love how much of a savage Laura is to Eddie. Ha! Huh, you're just a gutless fatso! What'd you have to say that for? You know, I also really love Laura's mannerisms in the scene, like, you know, the way she's fidgeting here. She's acting just like a child would, and I think little authentic details like this go a long way in making characters feel real. But if you did something bad, why don't you just say you were sorry? I love when she says this. Her childlike innocence is such a stark contrast to the characters around her in the story. I love how at the very end of the bowling alley on one of the lanes, there's a box of handgun bullets. I only found these for the first time years after my first playthrough. This 
town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? Classic. I love how you can see Maria has a tiny bit of belly fat over her skirt. It's a great little detail and apparently was an intentional choice by Team Silent. It's always refreshing to see realistic body types in video games. I love the track that plays in Heaven's Night. Silent Hill was doing lo-fi years before it was trendy. I love the comments James makes when he interacts with things. They usually give you a little bit of insight into his personality and life. Like in Heaven's Night, for example, James' comments towards the alcohol seems to imply he had some kind of drinking problem before the events of the game. Actually, about that, if you go to Neely's bar at the beginning of the game, you can find the iconic line on the wall, there was a hole here, it's gone now. It's up for debate what this could mean, but I always felt it was suggesting James used drinking as a coping mechanism. He was filling the void with alcohol. One last thing about Neely's bar. If you go back there after the hospital, you can find a new message on the wall. It says, if you really want to see Mary, you should just die. But you might be heading to a different place than Mary, James. This never fails to send chills down my spine. There's a lot of great documents and files you can find in this game, but I always loved this one in particular. It seems to be written by a doctor about a patient who is insane and living in their own reality, but the doctor ends up questioning the morality of his career, ending the file with the line, Why, I ask myself, why in the name of healing him must we drag him painfully into the world of our own reality? Pretty heavy stuff. I love how when you enter rooms in Brookhaven Hospital, Maria is just standing there. <laughs> it always gives me a fright every damn time I play this game. It is scarier than the actual spooks in this game, dude, I swear. While we're talking about Brookhaven Hospital, one of the puzzles in the area seems to follow a patient who is obsessing over a woman named Louise. We find some of his writing around the hospital, like this creepy file and a bloodied writing on one of the walls in this padded cell. When we manage to find all the codes and keys needed to unlock this heavily guarded box in his room, you open it up to find just a lock of hair. So creepy. A similar puzzle exists in Silent Hill 3, but this time we're the ones being stalked. I love how in the hospital, Maria eventually feels unwell and lies down in one of the bedrooms, kind of mirroring how Mary became bedridden because of her illness. I like how if you revisit the room Maria is resting in when you're in the other world, she's gone and you just hear really loud breathing instead. When Maria eventually finds you in the basement of the hospital, I love how angry she sounds when she's giving out to James. Monica Taylor Horgan did a fantastic job voicing both Mary and Maria. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? You don't sound very happy to see me. I was almost killed back there. Why didn't you try to save me? All you care about is that dead wife of yours. I've never been so scared in my whole life! I love as well how quickly her mood changes and she begs James to take care of her. Maria acts very emotionally needy throughout the game, and I like to think this is mirroring how Mary would have been needy as well towards James during her illness. I love how you can make James fall off ledges. There's not many opportunities to do it, but the fact the animation exists at all is a great detail in and of itself. I love the painting of Pyramid Head you find in the Historical Society and James's reaction to it. Misty Day, Remains of the Judgment. It's him. I love how when you find Eddie in Toluca prison with the dead body near him, he keeps flip-flopping between saying he killed him and that he had nothing to do with it. He's so erratic and his sanity deteriorates in every cutscene he's in. On that note, I love Toluca prison. It is so eerie and by far my favourite area in the game. I love the simplicity of this jump scare. Silent Hill very rarely uses jump scares, so when it does, it gets you good. Even though the Order plays very little part in Silent Hill 2, there's strong reason to believe they were trying to indoctrinate the prisoners into their cult. One prison cell has a lot of occult imagery and drawings, and another cell has a symbol that looks very similar to the Halo of the Sun, the signature symbol of the Order. In the guillotine area, I love the sound effects you hear in the background. It sounds like horses galloping, and in the big, open, dark space, it can really feel the anxiety. Toluca Prison treated its prisoners very poorly, and the sound is apparently implying that prisoners were tortured by being dragged across the rough ground by horses. This theory is strengthened by the fact you pick up a horseshoe before leaving the area. I love the brief segment when you're in the well. 
Maybe it's just me, but I always got super claustrophobic during this section. The idea of falling down a well and being trapped just freaks me out. I love how later in the game when you can find Pyramid Head roaming the halls of the labyrinth, if you manage to put a monster between you and him, Pyramid Head will just start violently attacking the monster instead. I love how the corpses you encounter in the game all look like James. Green jacket, jeans, black shoes. I love this comment James makes about Mary when you investigate the piano in Lakeview Hotel. I remember how much Mary liked to play the piano. She wasn't very good. I love how the sign for Brookhaven Hospital is misspelled in-game as Blookhaven. This is because the sounds L and R as we know them in English don't really exist in the Japanese language, so it's kind of understandable that a Japanese dev team would make this error. Don't worry though, it was corrected in Silent Hill 3. This isn't the only misspelling though. I love the sign outside the hospital that says Permit Perking Only. Ah bless. I love how after the cutscene with Eddie in Toluca Prison, you can see a portrait of the cafeteria on the wall. If you look at the portrait closely, you can see the same corpse as seen in the cutscene before, but it's clearly wearing James's outfit. On that topic, I love how in every single scene of the game involving Eddie, there's a corpse nearby. This theme continues during his boss fight, where you're in a meat locker, literally surrounded by corpses. I love how since the labyrinth obviously doesn't have its own map, James just starts drawing his own. It's such a good detail, I love this. I love that when you enter the cell block, James looks up at something in one of the corners of the cells, but we, the players, can't see it. You can shoot it, and it makes noises that sound pretty human too. Perfect example in horror of how not showing something can actually end up being scarier than showing it. The off-screen monster is saying something too. Ritual. Probably ties back to the whole cult indoctrination thing. I love that there's a very interesting consistency with room 208 throughout the game. In room 208 of Woodside Apartments, you find a dead body in front of the television that looks a lot like James. If you approach and then walk away from room 208 in Blue Creek Apartments, you can sometimes hear a rattle as if someone is on the other side. Later on in the labyrinth, the room where you find Maria's dead body has a sign outside it saying room 208. Finally, in Lakeview Hotel, you can sometimes hear someone sobbing when you pass room 208 in the West Wing. It makes you wonder if it had some kind of significance to James's life. Maybe Mary's hospital room was room 208, for example. I love the small cemetery you find shortly after the labyrinth. There's a grave for Eddie and Angela, and James's one is left unfinished, probably because he's the only person of the three who has yet to face the reality of his actions. We then end up jumping into the grave, it really doesn't get more on the nose than that. I love how the rooms when you first meet Eddie and Angela hold some significance to their character or backstory. As I mentioned earlier, Angela has a massive mirror representing her tendency to be self-critical, while Eddie has a room filled with posters and memorabilia of American football. As we later learn, he shot a football player and his dog before coming to the town of Silent Hill. Then he came after me. I shot him too, right in the leg. He cried more than the dog! <laughs> when you kill Eddie and he collapses, you can see his fingers slowly unravel from the gun. I love that attention to detail, as morbid as it is. You carry Mary's letter with you throughout the whole game, and if you pay close attention to it in your inventory, you'll see it changes towards the end of the story. After killing Eddie, the writing on the letter disappears, leaving a blank note. After watching the videotape in the hotel, the note itself disappears. Finally, after the Pyramid Head fight, the envelope disappears as well. In my opinion, this means the letter only existed to draw James back to Silent Hill and realise what he's done. Once he's accepted his actions, the letter disappears, having served its purpose. Another interesting detail about the letter is that its translation slightly deviates from the Japanese original. In English, she says, In my restless dreams, I see that town, Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. In Japanese, she actually blames herself for not being able to return to the town. The Japanese text translates more like, you promised you'd take me again, but it's my fault that we couldn't. Crazy how a slight change of wording makes all the difference. In English, she's blaming James, but in Japanese, she's blaming herself. I love how by the end of the game, there are two pyramid heads, each representing people James has murdered. One for Mary, and now one for Eddie. I love how you never see Maria interact with any other character besides James in the game. This is especially obvious when she doesn't want to go into the bowling alley where Eddie and Laura are because she hates bowling. I think this is because Maria is just a manifestation of the town and not a real person, so if she went inside, the others wouldn't see her and James would quickly realise she isn't real. 
On that note, I love the name of Maria's subscenario in the director's cut of the game. Born from a wish. I always felt this name further solidifies that she's not real, and just a manifestation by the town. A really interesting theory suggests James saw the poster of Maria in the bathroom at the beginning of the game, and the town manifested her from his subconscious. Eddie? I... I killed a... a human being. A human being. Mary. Did you really die three years ago? I love how when James is mourning over having to kill Eddie, he immediately mentions Mary. The fact that she is what came to mind after he murdered someone is a very good touch considering what we learn by the end of the game. I love how if you try to go up to the third floor of Lakeview Hotel before you have the key, you can hear this. I love how Laura's voice actress, Jackie Breckenridge, is misspelled as Jakey Breckenridge in the credits. This must have caused a bit of confusion back in the day. I love how if you use the chainsaw, James sometimes does this. I love how when you first get the radio at the very beginning of the game, you can hear a fairly indecipherable voice, but I always felt one line sounded a little clearer than the rest. I love that when you use the three stone tablets on the guillotine, you might notice that there's three nooses, one for each character, James, Eddie, and Angela. I love the boat ride over to Lakeview Hotel. I mean, I'd love it more if the controls didn't suck ass, but I do love that you see the light in the distance and you slowly approach it, you know, it just the section feels like the calm before the storm. I love that Lakeview Hotel seems perfectly intact when we first visit it, but after James watches the videotape and realizes he was the one who murdered Mary, it becomes decrepit, burnt down, destroyed. As it turns out, this is the true version of the hotel. Lakeview Hotel was destroyed in a fire before the events of the game. This is confirmed by a painting we can see in Toluca Prison. One of the prisoners painted the hotel burning down. The pristine version of the hotel we explored before the videotape is, in fact, its otherworld counterpart. Once James realizes what he's done, we see the hotel for how it truly is. Run down and destroyed. Man, I love the music that plays during this cutscene with Laura. The track is called Laura Plays the Piano, and it is easily one of my favorite tracks in the entire franchise. Is this the quiet, beautiful place she was talking about? Me and Mary talked a lot about Silent Hill. She even showed me all her pictures. She really wanted to come back. That's why I'm here. During this cutscene, we get to read Mary's letter to Laura that she wrote shortly before passing away. My dearest Laura, I'm leaving this letter with Rachel to give to you after I'm gone. I'm far away now, in a quiet, beautiful place. Please forgive me for not saying goodbye before I left. Be well, Laura. Don't be too hard on the sisters. And Laura, about James. I know you hate him because you think he isn't nice to me, but please give him a chance. It's true he may be a little surly sometimes, and he doesn't laugh much, but underneath he's really a sweet person. Laura, I love you like my very own daughter. If things had worked out differently, I was hoping to adopt you. Happy 8th birthday, Laura. Your friend forever, Mary. Man, that adoption line just gets me every time. This is all going well until you realize the text on the actual letter are the lyrics to Blaze of Glory by Bon Jovi. Yep, I'm not even joking. Look up. While we don't know exactly how the hotel burned down, there's a cool detail if you go back to the employee lounge after getting your flashlight back. If you examine the curtain, you can find a heater that is writing on it, saying, I'm Johnny, one hot guy. The heater is sitting right under a curtain, so maybe the curtain caught fire. The implication is a lot more blatant in the Italian localization of the game, where the text instead says, I'm Johnny, and I create sparks. I also love the music that plays after you exit room 312. The song is called Blank Fairy, and with the dripping water, dreary visuals, droning music, and the shocking realization of what James has done, this brief section of the game was always the most emotionally heavy to me. The song perfectly encapsulates the misery and hopelessness James is likely feeling at this point in the story. Following on from that, I love that track that plays directly after, which fans have unofficially titled Warped Heart. Instead of the droning, depressing sounds of Blank Fairy, this one sounds a bit more calm, but still very melancholic. If Blank Fairy conveys the realization of what James has done, then Warped Heart conveys the acceptance of what he's done, at least in my opinion. I love Mary's monologue during the final hallway before the game ends. It absolutely breaks my heart. Look, I'm disgusting. I don't deserve flowers. 
between the disease and the drugs. I look like a monster. Right before that hallway, you can actually find a wall with markings on it that somewhat resemble a face. It's subtle enough that you could run past it without noticing, but geez, once you do, it's pretty creepy. I love it. I love that you get a different credits theme depending on which ending you get. I think it goes without saying for anyone who's played this game, but I absolutely love the entire letter reading at the end of the game. Her delivery is amazing, and man, I just cannot watch this ending without crying. Do what's best for you, James. James. You made me happy. And that makes a hundred. I'm not done. <laughs> Almost there, just a few more. I love that Maria's towel in her sub-scenario Born From A Wish looks very similar to Mary's clothes. I love that Maria has her own unique save screen, and yep, it is just as unnerving as James's. I love how when exploring Baldwin Mansion and examine a teddy bear in Amy's room, Maria says this. Stuffed animals line the top of the shelf. Nothing very interesting. Oh, is this a teddy bear? It's not very well made, but it's sort of cute anyway. I bet Laura would love it. She loves bears. Laura? Who am I talking about? This really drives the point home that Maria is just a manifestation of the town, imprinted with Mary's memories of Laura. This is further proven when Ernest says this. He's looking for the you. That isn't you. I mean, it needs no explanation. How can you not love the dog ending? I love the music that plays on the results screen for this game. Compared to the rest of the soundtrack, it sounds a lot more hopeful and calming. I love the fact that all the game's puzzles are defined by how quickly you boot up a new playthrough, at least for the PC version of the game. Speedrunners of Silent Hill 2 actually manipulate the system to figure out the puzzles during a run. It works like this. How fast you click new game and select your puzzle and action difficulty gives you a certain seed. You can only figure out what seed you get when you do the clock puzzle in the apartments, but once you do, you can figure out every puzzle solution in the game just from that. To your average player, however, these solutions just seem completely randomized. This is quite an unconventional way of having your puzzles function in a game, but I kind of love the mechanics of it. Speaking of speedrunning, I love how if you abuse the quick save and quick load features on the PC version of the game, you can duplicate the spiral writing key and completely avoid the bug room. On the topic of quick save and quick load, I love how manipulating these mechanics can completely break the game. If you spam quick save, James can just keep sprinting. Normally he gets fatigued after a few seconds. You can also skip certain forced cutscenes by spamming quick save and go out of bounds in the hotel to completely skip the elevator section and save a good five minutes of playtime. Just keep running in the endless black void and... Okay, 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 I am actually done this time. <laughs> That'll do it. 109 things that I love about Silent Hill 2. And the craziest part, or the saddest part, depending on how you want to look at it, <laughs> is that it wasn't even that hard to think of them. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. If you want more of this kind of content, I stream horror games three times a week over on my Twitch. I actually speedrun Silent Hill 2 one of those days. Now, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but I do it. <laughs> so if you want more of that kind of content, hit me up on Twitch. Or alternatively, if you just want updates on future videos and all that jazz, you can hit me up on Twitter. Once again, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.